It's time to get your proper new tips and tricks with a different pro every week. I'm Tom Sloan. And I'm Jack Lewis. And you're listening to Pizza and Property. Property. Hello and welcome to Pizza and Property. <laughs> I'm your host, Todd Sloan. And I'm Jack Gibson. <laughs> Is that really what I sound like? <laughs> nah. <laughs> but... Oh God, hello and welcome to Pizza and Property. I don't think I said it as well as Jack. That's got me in tears, mate. Thank you for that <laughs> for that impersonation. <laughs> oh, uh, what's been happening? Oh, the terribleness apparently. Yeah, the world's uh, ending. Well, at least the stock market is. Yeah, seven um, percent uh, on Monday, mm-hmm. and then I think another four on Tuesday down. Yeah, I I don't trade, uh, and I don't really have uh, hold much stock, but. I, I'm just looking at this thinking, this is probably the time to get in, but I don't know enough about it. Like all of my, my eggs are in the property basket. Yeah, well, the, well, the way you've got to look at it is there's opportunity everywhere, but everyone's superannuation, well, the majority, unless you've got a self-managed super fund. No, I don't, don't really rate them. One of the standard, like, so most super funds are invested in the stock market. Yeah, well, I guess I do have the so- like super. I I just don't even think about my super. Mm. I, I've just always looked at that as like that's it's rubbish anyway. Like obviously you you take care of it, you do that, but I just I never thought you don't have access to it until you. Well, it's not ex- even that. I've never yeah. thought it's actually going to be enough to retire on anyway. Yeah. It's it's going to be enough to have like a meaning a minimal existence from yeah. what I've been told. So it's kind of just that yeah, that's the thing in the background as far as I'm concerned. It's imp- let's have a let's have a discussion about superannuation after. Yeah, yeah. Like off air or like a, a, a podcast about it, or both. Both. Yeah. Okay. I was cool. I was thinking off air, but let's get someone on to talk about it. it's it's important. It's very important. Yeah, I what, believe. Yeah. Even buying properties in your your super fund? Nah, I probably wouldn't do that. I'd mm. buy properties. I'd create wealth outside of your super fund. Yeah. Yeah, and then have have super as a backup. It's incredible the the small differences that you make early on in life. Mm-hmm. It's like a compounding effect. By the yep. time you get to retirement, it can make it a massive amount of difference. Yeah. Well, I just remember looking at some stats saying that people are going to like effectively on the average wage now, yeah. if they keep putting away their normal nine, ten percent, whatever the super contribution it's is, it's not going to be. Yeah. It's going to be like quarter of a million dollars, yeah. and it'll be like, yeah, good luck retiring on a quarter of a million dollars in twenty fifty. Yeah. Like, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Not going to happen. Yeah. Um. So toilet paper crisis. <laughs> yeah. I almost fell into it. I thought it wasn't real. And then I, I went to, to Coles and I was like, wow, this is real. And then I went into Woolies and it was like, hardly any of it was on the shelf. Yep. And all of a sudden I'm like, should I get five packs? Yep. And I almost, and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be, you know, what? actually I did hear a good joke though. Yep. For anyone listening at home, the quick way to figure out your IQ, 150 minus how many rolls of toilet paper you've got stored at home. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like an absolute noob. I went up there to get toilet paper. Like we needed it for the house. We'd run yeah. out. There was no toilet paper in the yeah. house. I felt like an absolute, I got, there was about six packets left on the shelf and I got one. I said, I made the disclaimer to the lady, like this is, I, I, we actually need this toilet paper at home. We don't have any left. <laughs> You do. You feel like you're being judged. And for something that you shouldn't, it's like yeah. the most basic common luxury there is. Yeah. Uh, um, but anyway, so, I mean, this is all stemming from the coronavirus. And, and none of us uh, are medical experts. This is in no way, shape or form any kind of a medical podcast. But from, from what I understand, it's something that is, is having a massive effect on the world. It's, it needs to be taken seriously because, I mean, from, from what I understand about pandemics, yep. they're, they're nothing until they're really something. Yeah. And, and it's making sure that that tipping point is managed, which from what I understand, we're doing quite well. Like yep. a, as a globe, as a species, mm. we're, we're doing a good job of this. From, yep. Again, from my non-medical understanding, but we need to take it seriously so it is actually it doesn't managed correctly. Worse, yeah. it, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So no more posts about how you're holding a Corona beer saying I've got the coronavirus. I just need some Lyme disease to go along with it. Like, <laughs> I'm so over those. But otherwise, mate, like, anything that you're thinking of to, to be able to actually use this situation as a positive, some kind of a positive spin for you? No, but something I found quite interesting. I heard somebody speaking on, somebody compared the current state of the uh, economy to the GFC mm-hmm. and the stimulus package that Kevin Rudd did in the GFC. So mm-hmm. gave out $900 cash to people that were eligible. Yep. Um, and the difference between this one is that back then it was a demand. So the issue was demand. There was a lack of demand. So putting that money in people's pockets allowed them to go out and have a bit of extra cash to, to buy your TV, buy your whatever. Mm-hmm. The issue with this time around is that it's a supply chain issue. So the, the demand is there, 
It's just there's going to be issues not being able to supply the demand. That and, makes perfect sense. And your standard cash injection into the economy, like just money in the in people's back pockets, isn't going to have the same effect as what it did for the global financial crisis. Yeah, because I mean, most of the products that we're, we're buying, apart from toilet paper, ironically, seventy nine no ninety seven percent of it's actually produced domestically, from what I understand. Yeah, most of the products we are buying are bought overseas. Mm. So and from China, where yeah. apparently this uh, all originated. I watched a documentary on it last night. It was from the the wet markets that they've got over there. Oh, have you we, seen the v- videos of those markets? Yeah, and I'm I'm not really a fan of that, especially as someone that doesn't eat meat. It's not not exactly my my prime time watching. But wanted to just understand this better. It, it seems like that's where it came from. I know there's a ton of conspiracy theories out there of where else it came from. Who who actually knows? Yeah. But the the fact is, we've got it here. It's affecting the economy, yep. and we need to make sure that we're just diligent about it and just do whatever we can really yeah but yeah anyway i don't actually think that's solving any problems but you know what if we could solve the whole coronavirus economic problem i think this would be the world's biggest podcast right now yeah so maybe we should try that that should be a problem we're working on yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a new new, new podcast series. yeah absolutely but before we actually uh solve world problems why don't we have a talk about details and a man that absolutely loves details probably more than anyone that I've ever spoken to in my life. Yes. So Mike Mortlock you're talking about. I am talking about Mike Mortlock. From MCG Quantity Surveyors. Yes. Now tell us a little bit about Mike before we actually jump on the line to him. So Mike is a quantity surveyor himself, very knowledgeable about what you can claim as a depreciating asset in terms of investment properties, tax appreciation schedules we're going to talk about, what I'd really like to talk about. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, just pick his brains on, on all things tax depreciation and investment property. Fantastic. Well, let's let's get him on the line now. G'day, Mike. How are you going? G'day, Mike. I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, especially being animated, if, if that's still on the cards. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> how how would you like to be dressed? How are you dressed now, actually? So I'm wearing a tutu and a beret. <laughs> so if you can just recreate, actually, I should be careful because you know you guys might be likely to do. I'm <laughs> wearing shorts and a t-shirt, but you know whatever you see fit. The tutu can happen. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the staff would get a kick out of that. I'm sure. I'll leave it up to you guys. Maybe we'll spice it up. <laughs> oh, God. Well, look, we, we know it's uh, quite a late podcast at the moment, so we're actually doing this one at sort of 7 o'clock at night or whatever the time is as well because you're, you're in Newcastle, so we want to be respectful and not keep you away from friends and families any longer than you need to be. That's fine. I'm a tax depreciation legislation guy, so you'll be surprised to know that uh, – <laughs> I have very little friends and social life, so I'm, I'm here for you guys. Oh, that sounds terrible. Okay, well, um, <laughs> well, let's jump into it then. Jack, did you have the first question, mate? Yeah, maybe, Mike, we'll just get you to explain what a tax depreciation schedule is and how it benefits property investors. Yeah, well, essentially, it's a report very similar to a valuation report, as you know very well, Jack. Um, the difference between, I guess, a, a market valuation and a tax depreciation schedule is the purposes that you would use it for. And for a tax depreciation schedule, it excludes the land value. So it's really just the improvement to the block of land, so the building structure itself. And the tax depreciation schedule report just shows you what deductions you can claim based on all the components of your investment property per year, and that figure comes off your taxable income. So the whole purpose of it is to help you save tax. Yeah, brilliant. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Well, what are some of the things that are really included in a good depreciation schedule? Because de- let me let me say that right. Depreciation schedule. Because yeah. I know there's a lot of detail involved, isn't there? Yeah, there there is. And I think it's, it's become a little bit more complicated given the legislation changes. And depending on whether it's residential or commercial, depends on the effective lives uh, and the different assets that are, are available. Essentially, there's two main components. There's the building structure and the plant and equipment items. The building structure and any structural improvements are pretty pretty easy as far as the depreciation schedule goes because it's just a 2.5% flat depreciation claim each financial year. The plant and equipment items are all different based on their effective life. So the Commissioner of Taxation says that carpets have, for example, an eight-year effective life. And then there's a little formula to work out what the percentage decline in value each year would be. But yeah, the schedule just shows you all the plant equipment, all the building structure. It shows it in two different depreciation methods. 
and it'll normally show 40 years worth of deductions as well. So it's a pretty technical document. Most of them are sort of 18 to 30 pages because they're really, they're really created with accountants in mind. So I know like with our business, we have a, a video that we send just after the report to say, here's how to read the bloody thing. <laughs> Right, okay, because I'd imagine you get a lot of people opening it up and just going, oh, what have I just paid for? I don't understand any of this. Yeah, that's actually a, it's a tricky thing for us to sort of, I guess, do a good job for our clients. What they can see is that, okay, we, we might have had good service and we were friendly on the phone and we got it done quickly, but they, they find it really difficult to tell whether we did actually a technically good job or not. It's one of those things that's kind of like, all right, well, thanks, you guys are great. The report doesn't mean anything to me, but, you know, thanks. Thanks for doing it for me. So, so I did that to sort of just try and say, look, here's what your total deductions are. Here's why that might not match your purchase price. If you've made any improvements, this is where you'll see them. This is the page that shows you your tax deductions. And there's a couple of, of different things I've shared recently about what the tax deductions mean for an individual. Happy to share that if that's um, yeah, appropriate yeah, yeah, for you. Absolutely. So um, it depends, of course, on your marginal rate what deductions you'll get back and of course the depreciation claims that you've got but in a little hypothetical that I came up with a a property investor that's on $100,000 of income if they had a depreciation schedule on say a a new house you could expect around about $11,000 worth of depreciation deductions so that actually brings the taxable income for that investor down to $89,000. And if you're on a hundred grand a year, you're paying around about twenty four thousand dollars in tax. And if you're on eighty nine thousand dollars a year, you're paying about twenty thousand dollars in tax. So it's really four thousand dollars sort of back in your pocket. That's really the the value proposition of a depreciation schedule. Yeah. So we're talking what's that? Like around seventy eighty bucks a week cash flow back in your pocket if you were to sort of amortize that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty important thing for property investors to, to, to utilize to maximize their cash flow and obviously to hold on to their properties as their portfolio grows and they're trying to service them. And yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy not to do it. We're, I always say to people, look, you know, use me or use someone else. Just use somebody. Yeah. Well, on that note then as well, what's the difference between a depreciation schedule that's done well and one that's not done well? Is is it all of the, the detail or what's the difference? Yeah, look, it depends on the circumstances of, of the individual. There are certain, I guess, types of reports that we do that you can really kind of tailor it specific to the client. So pre-2017, if you had somebody that lived in the property and then made it available for rent, there were circumstances where you could sort of minimise the deductions for the period where it was an owner-occupied property and then maximise it from the point that it's available to produce income. And to actually achieve better results for them, that might actually mean underestimating the value of an asset rather than overestimating it. These days, I guess it really just comes down to a, a couple of components. It's It's the work that's done on site. So we put a lot of effort and training into identifying improvements that are done to properties. And a lot of investors may not even realise that their property's been extended or renovated, as silly as it sounds. Um, I've certainly personally seen examples where there have been extensions. And and you can see that with a trained eye, but the owner just didn't realise that that wasn't the original sort of shape and size of the building. If you have a look underneath the floor and you see a set of stairs in the middle of the house, that's a good clue that the back door used to be somewhere else. Um, So the inspection's key. And obviously the the person doing the report's important. And of course, there's the framework as well. So the way that the reports are put together, they sort of differ from company to company. But most of the full service firms that are doing the right thing and doing a full detailed inspection are going to be very, very similar, I, I, I would say, I would hope. Okay, so it's really about having someone that, that maybe looks a little bit closer than others to find things that others might miss, but otherwise it's it's a little bit of a like for like. That's what I'm kind of hearing. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah, look, I, I think when they're working within the confines of the, the tax depreciation rulings and the legislation, you can't sort of put things in certain boxes that don't, uh, that don't belong or don't exist. Absolutely. When something... Pardon me. When something costs a certain value, you can't really say that it costs any more if there's heaps of evidence of that fact. 
So yeah, it really just comes down to the the expertise of the person putting together, and it's easy to to miss things, and it's easy to 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 look at things and not necessarily categorize them the right way. Yeah. Just out of interest, if someone just overcapitalized, and this is just more of a comical sort of hypothetical, and let's yeah. say that they've got like a half million dollar house, and they just went absolutely crazy and spent four hundred grand on the kitchen, right? Would that actually make any difference to the depreciation, the fact that they didn't put in like a, a standard twenty or fifty thousand dollar kitchen or whatever, that the fact that they actually spent four hundred, or would you just look at that and go, I don't care if you spent four million, like it's a kitchen? Yeah. Look, that that's I guess where a quantity surveyor and a valuer may may differ. So when people talk about an overcapitalized property, I guess that's they spent more money than they're likely to get back in terms of a value or if they were to sell the property. With tax depreciation, it, it's different. So the tax office says that you can claim essentially what you spend on a property and overcapitalized properties are great to buy, not necessarily overcapitalize yourself. But if you buy that overcapitalized property, then a quantity survey can come in and estimate the value of the work. <laughs> and if we can see that there's a $5,000 oven in a property that's only sort of worth $300,000 in some weird industrial estate with a few junkies out the front, it's still a very expensive oven. It's just in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So from a tax depreciation point of view, purchasing an overcapitalized property is definitely a a benefit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's a a strategy that people should chase if it falls in your lap, and I think it's great. Um, even though I'm a depreciation nerd and this is my, my trade, people people will contact me and say, what's the best property for depreciation? And I sort of say, look, I'll tell you that, but I just want to make sure that you're not going and making your investment decisions purely based on depreciation That's because the point. best property to buy if you're wanting to get maximum depreciation is an off-the-plan unit that's got, say, 800 units and six levels of basements and four gyms and a cinema. Now, that is going to be great because you own a percentage share of all that stuff, but your strata fees are going to murder you, and chances are it's not going to be the best for capital growth, and you might have huge vacancy rental periods and um, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, just on that, with um, buying something that's been overcapitalized, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that changed back in, uh, I think you even just referenced it then, 2017. Like if, I, if I was to sell Jack my property with my depreciation schedule now from renos I did, he can't claim those renos. Isn't that how it works or not? Have I got that back, backwards? Not supplying equipment. You, you've got that half right. Half so, right. Okay. yes. Yeah. Yes, on the 9th of May 2017, so it was 7.30pm, that was when our esteemed Treasurer ScoMo delivered the budget speech. It's a very famous night for quantity surveyors and it ruined a really good bottle of Shiraz I had over at the time. <laughs> but what, what, that, what that legislation was about is that if you exchange contracts after 7.30 on the 9th of May 2017, that you were impacted by the changes and that basically said you couldn't claim plant equipment depreciation deductions unless you either bought a property that was brand new or you renovated and installed that asset yourself. Now, that doesn't mean you have to actually lay the carpet yourself, but you pay for brand new carpet in your property. So in that situation where you're buying, pardon me, an overcapitalized property, you will only be able to claim the Division 43 or the structural improvements. So you won't be able to claim the plant equipment, things like carpets, ovens, cooktops, floor coverings, curtains, blinds, that sort of thing. But when you consider, say, a major renovation, the majority of the value is going to be in the building structure. And and the building structure as a name is sort of a little bit misleading. So obviously structure sort of relates to the outside of the dwelling, you know, the frame, the timber frame, the bricks and mortar, the concrete slab and the roof. But the building structure also includes things like tiling and gyp rock and kitchen covers and kitchen bench tops and things like that, shower screens as well. So yes, the the rules aren't as good for buying a, an overcapitalized property because you used to be able to claim all those juicy plant and equipment deductions, but now it's just the building structure. But there's still normally enough. If someone's done a massive renovation to something and overcapitalized it, there should still be enough building structure deductions to make it a worthwhile schedule. That was a brilliant answer, Mike. Thank you very much because I've I've been thinking uh, since 2017 that it was just kind of 
all wiped out. I didn't realize that it was actually broken up into the two sections like that. Well, that's good. I, I hope that everyone that had that same opinion is listening right now <laughs> because potentially that means we're going to get a few more phone calls. But, um, yeah, look, education is, is, is a big part of, of what we do as quantity surveyors. When I started, it was educating accountants about the, alliance, uh, the allowances, which seems a little bit weird to say now. These days, it's, it's educating investors. And, and I think property investors, certainly on the residential side, are relatively switched on. I think most people have got a reasonable knowledge, but the changes were a little bit tricky to navigate and there are some sort of unusual nuances to it as well. So somebody sitting at home thinking, oh, I just get my accountant to kind of do my deductions for me. Can you maybe speak on why it's more important to get a proper tax depreciation schedule done as opposed to having your accountant just kind of wing what he thinks or he or she thinks you might be able to deduct? Yeah, and and if and if the term sort of wing isn't enough to convince people, I don't know what is, you know. Um, but yeah, look, if your accountant is looking after it, there's maybe one example where it's okay. That might be there's no real deductions available in your investment property, and you're just adding one or two bits and pieces. So if you add a split system or some carpet, you don't need a quantity survey to estimate the value because you'll have an invoice and you'll be able to say. I bought the carpet on this date, it was this much, and the accountant should be able to look up the effective life and depreciate it that way. That's the only example where an accountant could do it. They're not qualified to estimate construction values, and of course, in that instance, there's no estimating required. But if your property does qualify for deductions and your accountant is winging it, as you say, chances are they are just pulling out a couple of plant and equipment items. So they might say, okay, well, I'm going to depreciate the carpet and the hot water system and the kitchen appliances. And they're likely to estimate really quite, uh, I guess, low values. So, so safe values, because if the ATO was to order them, they would probably look at it and say, look, that's really underdone. We probably won't even mention this because if they do get an expert to do it, <laughs> we're just going to have to give them back more tax. Um, so not only is that not going to stand up to an audit if the ATO look at you, but chances are that accountant is going to miss some things like split system air conditioning and door closers and bathroom accessories. And there's all sorts of things that us as specialists can put in there. We can estimate you know, a, a proper value for it rather than a conservative value. And it can make a real difference. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, well, especially when you're adding up so many little things, it, it does make a huge difference. And the she'll be right attitude is definitely not something that you want from a an accountant. No, there's, there's certain things where you know she'll be right maybe is okay. You know, like you stub your toe and it goes a little bit black or something. You're like, oh, you know, probably come good. But when it comes to purchasing an investment property or tax related matters. I think that's where you've sort of got to say, look, you know, I, I want to invest in experts to make sure I'm doing this properly because the potential negatives far outweigh the cost of engaging someone. And you'd hope that the account would say it as well. I mean, I think that a professional really does know where their weaknesses lie. Mm. And I actually had a gentleman come into the office today, funnily enough, and like, I'm in Adelaide and asking about a commercial building uh, that he wanted to sell in Canberra. I was like, I'll sit down and have a coffee. Like, I'm happy to chat, but like, I'm not the person to help you. Like, was... <laughs> yeah, I can look up RP data and give you some comparables, but I've never driven by any of these places, and you know, I've got no idea. No, I think like it, I think there's a certain value in humility, and not not to mention the fact that you, if you're going outside your area of expertise, you can open yourself up to to be exposed to being sued. Mm. So there's often questions that we get that are sort of grey between us and accountants. And whilst we're registered tax agents, we're, we're not accountants. So I might say, look, anecdotally, this is what I hear from clients and this is my view, but I'm not actually qualified to give you an opinion. You need to speak to this person. Mm -hmm. So I hate to be one of those disclaimer people. So I normally say, look, this is my view, but to rely on this, you need to speak to an expert. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, what are some of the common items that you actually see investors don't get on their depreciation schedules, like because they haven't had it, it done properly and actually completed in the way that it should be? Back in the day, it was it was probably things like the low value pooling schedule, where there's legislation that says that if you purchase a property, uh, or let's say an, an asset that has a value of under a thousand dollars, you can write that off at a at a higher rate. 
but it, you can also consider assets that become under a thousand dollars over time. So let's say you have a thirteen hundred dollar dishwasher, and in the first year it gives you two hundred dollars worth of deductions, and then the next one it gives you eighty. Eventually, it becomes under a thousand dollars in residual value, and you can drop that into the accelerated pool. There are a lot of quantity surveyors that didn't necessarily take that approach, didn't understand that legislation, and that's where. If you're not working with a specialist, you can expose yourself to things like that. But I, I wouldn't say that I commonly see things missing from reports. With commercial ones, you do tend to see things that are missing or not broken up adequately. But the biggest epidemic is actually not getting a depreciation schedule or waiting too long to get it done. Um, We've, sh we've shared a bit of our data in a, in a press release recently looking at the whole of our sort of sample of, of residential tax depreciation schedules and we found that 6.7% of people that contacted us had actually done it too late to actually go back and claim all of their missed deductions. So you can back claim two financial years. So what I'm saying here is that these people purchased it more than two years ago and waited longer than two years to contact us. And the average amount of depreciation deductions missed was just slightly over $20,000. Yeah. Now, that could be eight or $9,000 out of that person's pocket. And we saw as much as mid $60,000 and I think 18 years worth of missed deductions on someone that bought a brand new unit off the plan oh. and contacted us 18 years later saying, what's all this depreciation thing about? It was one of the saddest things I've ever seen. You it's kind of, terrible. You'd feel for them, really, wouldn't you? Because it, it's really yeah, sounding absolutely. like it's not about these are the things I see wrong. It's just people not getting it done. That's the wrong thing. Yeah, and there must be some trusted advisors in there. And I think even if it's outside of your expertise, I'd encourage people to educate themselves a little bit more, you know, with real estate agents or property managers or conveyances. I think it's important to know a little bit more than your area of expertise you don't have to provide commentary or give estimates or anything like that but just just a, i guess a little bit of a, a an investor sort of pack to say okay you, you're buying this property you should speak to someone about your smoke alarm you should make sure you get a good property manager you should get your landlord insurance and just those sorts of things but thankfully we don't see that happening too often but yeah, still 6.7% of people that have actually engaged us to prepare a schedule. So the people that are still out there that haven't yeah. contacted us obviously aren't in our stats. So it could be worse. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's interesting. You touched on this briefly before, but on May the 10th or 9th or 10th, 2017, the federal government changed tax legislation around depreciation of assets, um, made some pretty big changes to it. Can you maybe talk us through what those changes were and what of those changes will be grandfathered or was grandfathered? And how and what year was that bottle of Shiraz that was ruined? <laughs> yeah, I think it almost certainly would have been a 2015 Hunter Valley. That was a great year, <laughs> great wine. I actually um, have a guy in the office who was trying to learn a little bit about wine and I said, look, just whenever you get a bottle, just have a look at the, the year and then just... They go, oh, it's a 2017 year, good year. We had a lot of rain that year. And I think there's probably only half a percent of people on earth that can say, oh, actually, that was a pretty low year for rainfall. <laughs> um, that's a tip for listeners, just to, to try and trick people into thinking you know something about wine. Um, that's a different podcast. Yeah. So, yeah, 9th of May, I was having my 2015 Shiraz. And, yeah, that was, that, was the, that was the budget speech that basically said from that moment on, we're only going to give tax depreciation deductions on the plant and equipment components to people buying new property or installing the assets themselves. So the idea is that if you purchase a property with previously used assets, so you weren't the first owner of that brand new asset, and that could even include a 10-month-old house, you're not able to claim any of the deductions on those plant equipment items, the carpets, the blinds, the appliances, the hot water systems, and that sort of thing. So it's a big sweeping change. Um, grandfathering was a really interesting one for me, and I think that that's something that a lot of people didn't quite understand. We, um, we were sort of crunching our data. I was in the middle of, of analysing a 1,000 of our residential reports for a different purpose, but it put me in a really great, great position that I had the data 
sort of on my computer the night of that announcement. So, of course, I drove in. Um, thankfully, I hadn't finished that bottle of red, so I was able to go in. Um, the, the bit that I had turned to ash in the mouth, mouth anyway. Um, and what we actually uncovered... We were really just sort of trying to find out well, how much of a residential tax depreciation business do we have left? So they didn't make any changes to commercial depreciation. So that's a big part of our business. Uh, we have an estimating side of our business as well. So we were unexposed there. But the residential part was still probably the biggest uh, component of our, of our business. So what we found out is that around about 70% of the properties were built after 1987. So that's the cutoff date for the, the building structure. Yep. So that meant that really we're going to find that 70% of people at least would we would still recommend the schedule being done. We found uh, around 46 or 44, it escapes me, percent of people are buying a brand new property. Um so that actually means that, yes, there's going to be a great depreciation schedule done there. And then with the leftover people that, that bought before 1987, we, we found that just over 60% of them had renovated the property yeah. and the average value was just under $40,000. So about $1,000 a year worth of deduction. So that actually gave us a magic figure that was around just shy of 84% of our last 1,000 residential schedules would have been worthwhile to do so that was one part of the data um am i putting anyone to sleep with this or can no, i go through no, the no, grandfathering I'm, bit as well i'm following the first thing <laughs> i'm thinking is if you're buying a house doing a cosmetic renovation on it that's built in 1983 like basically you're not getting a depreciation schedule done that's what i'm picking up so far is that right you're picking it up perfectly i'm i'm glad you've passed the test <laughs> um so with the grandfathering thing in, in the budget speech, they said anyone that purchased prior to this speech, so the 9th of May 2017, would be grandfathered. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that's interesting. Well, everyone that's contacting me for a depreciation schedule, you know, in the last little while has bought it before today, and they probably will contact me for another year and have bought before today. But there was a little caveat that said, okay, well, if you bought a property in 2013, say, you could only be grandfathered if the property was available for rent in the 1617 financial year. So basically said if you bought prior to that 2017 date, it had to be available for rent in that particular 365 days between the 1st of July 2016 and the 30th of June 2017 to be able to be truly grandfathered. So that complicated matters. And in our data, we found that just shy of a quarter of people actually live in their property prior to moving out of it, which is a big number from my perspective. Mm. I, I, I was surprised to see that nearly a quarter of people are, are sort of buying something, living in it, and then renting it out. So if you bought a property in 2017 in, say, January, a few months before the budget announcement, but you lived in it until a couple of years ago, even though you were bought prior to that to the announcement, you're not actually going to be grandfathered because the property wasn't available for rent. So that's a that's a tricky little nuance, and not a lot of people picked up on that. It is terribly boring. I can almost picture you guys sort of drifting off asleep. But this is something that quality surveyors like myself just really have to be across and make sure that we're we're, we're advocating for our clients and doing the best we can. No, I'm definitely not getting bored. My, my mind's ticking over. Is like, there, are there accountants out there that are using that wording available for rent uh, a little bit more loosely? Like, what does available mean? Like, how does That's that a, mean? Yeah. Advertised. Yeah. yeah. Does it have to be advertised or? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. A really, really good question. And there's, it's actually been tested a couple of times. Like, there have been people that have had rental properties in the middle of Northern Territory and it's been available for rent for 17 years but no one's ever rented it. And the tax officer said, well, this is ridiculous. Like, just because you've got a sign up, it's in the middle of nowhere. Nobody lives here. No one's going to rent it. Go away. We're not giving you the deductions. Or let's say you buy a two-bedroom unit in Coogee, and you rent it out for $18 million a week. That's not a reasonable available for rent because no one's going to pay $18 million for a two-bedroom unit in Coogee. Um, 
So normally available for rent means that you have signed an agency agreement with a property manager. You don't necessarily have to have a tenant in there. So if you buy an investment property and you say, okay, Mr. Century 21 or LJ Hooker or what have you, um, I agree that you're going to represent me in this property to find a tenant and then they start advertising for the tenant. From the date of signing it, it's probably, it's probably the, the most ironclad date that you can, you can have. Okay. So really a sales agent, or not sales agency, a rental agency is, is what you'd really need as the proof. That contract. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, exactly. There's, there's nothing that I've found specifically that the ATO has mentioned that, but the best way to prove something is true is for it to actually be true and for there to be documentary evidence to prove that it's true. So I think, yeah, that's probably just a bit of common sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel like uh, we've actually already really answered this um, about the the 1984 cosmetic reno. But I, I wanted to ask you beforehand. Like, I understand that some properties will really benefit from a tax depreciation schedule, and others won't. Apart from yep. the example I gave beforehand, um, are there any others that you can think of that it is just like a yeah, don't don't waste your time? Um, there's one maybe myth I'd like to bust, and that's that people sort of say, and, and quantity surveyors sometimes say, well, normally we get you know sixty percent of the purchase price in deductions, or we get up to eighty percent of the purchase price in deductions. I, I've seen a property that was purchased for eight million dollars have zero depreciation allowances available in it. It was in one of the exclusive waterfront suburbs in Sydney. It was built in the late 70s and it was left completely alone, never been touched, never renovated or improved. It was livable condition, but there just wasn't anything that qualified in it. So you would think if you're paying $8 million for a property, you'd get some pretty good deductions. But mm. in that one, we actually said to the client, look, we're really sorry, but there's nothing we can do for it. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful place, right? Um, so really the only time that it's not going to be worthwhile is if the property is built prior to the 16th of September 1987 and never had any improvements. But it's relatively rare. I mean, if you think about kitchens built in the, in the 80s, bathrooms built in the 80s, they're pretty ugly, right? And in most places where people want to buy investment properties, they're, they're in areas where people are doing them up and it's, chances are that if you renovate the kitchen and the bathroom, the value that you're going to get, if a valuer goes in to revalue it for you or if you're thinking of selling it or even just putting a tenant in and wanting to get the maximum rent, there's an incentive to do an improvement or a renovation to it. So we don't see it terribly often, though it does happen. In terms of, of, of typical renovations, we would see a kitchen. So uh, an oven, cooktop and range hood is plant and equipment. Really everything else in the kitchen is going to be building structure. Yep. So if you have a 20 grand kitchen, you probably find that 16 or 17 grand of it would be the structural components. Mm -hmm. Bathrooms are, are probably an even better example of Division 43 rather than plant and equipment. So in a bathroom, plant and equipment might be just some bathroom accessories like your toilet seat and your toilet roll holder. You might have a heat light or an exhaust unit. If you've got a fancy one, you've got heated towel rails and a spa bath pump, but that really exhausts most of the plant and equipment items. So the tiles, the bath, the shower screen, they're all structural things. Yep. And of course, things like sensors, carports, driveways, retaining walls, extensions to the floor plan, you know, enclosing garages or patios, those are all structural improvements that would you'd be able to claim deductions on. Yep. Beautiful. It sounds like I've um, still got a tax depreciation schedule available then because the bathroom's been uh, stripped back to studs and noggins, kitchen's completely new, so... It's structural. Yeah. Love yeah. it. What Brilliant. It? So <laughs> section 43, did you say, or what, what was it? Division 43, Division yeah. 43. So it's... It's Division 43 of the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1997. That's what makes me so rock and roll at barbecues, <laughs> is that sort of noise. <laughs> That's probably why I'm not out being social at, uh, at 7 o'clock on a, on a school night. But, um, but yeah, it's Division 40 and Division 43. So 40 is the plant and equipment and 43 is the, is the, the structural capital allowances. I absolutely love your enthusiasm, Mike. If if we're ever over in Newcastle, I'm going to bring a bottle of um, Dead Arm around, and like you sound like you'd be a lot of fun to chat with. Like in more, I love the Bjarenberg stuff. Oh. Um, that's, yeah, no, you 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 had me at Dead Arm. Have you been to to the Cube here in SA? I haven't. No. 
it's amazing. I made a little video on it. I'll, I'll send it to you later on. It's I say it in the video as well. It's like Willy Wonka and the Mad Hatter got together on a construction project. It's pretty like, impressive. It's amazing. Beautiful. I've got to check that out. I do get over to to South Australia every now and then. We we do have um we do have some work that we do in in Adelaide. We've got a service office over there, and we do a few schedules for people. But um, I'll have to find an excuse um to get over there. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do some some cube work in the de- with the dead arm. Yeah, sounds <laughs> good. <laughs> All right, Mike. We might finish off with a, a bit of a fun one. Um, Mike Mortlock from. MCG Quantity Surveyors, what is your favourite pizza? I think it's got to be Fungi. Fungi? <laughs> is that because you're such a fun guy? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Classic. <laughs> I, I couldn't help it. I, I swear, no, I, no. I must have children somewhere. I love a good dad joke. <laughs> well, you're well prepared, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Are there any parting words you might want to add? Anything we haven't covered that you, you want to... Get out? No, I don't think so. I mean, we're, we're, um, we share a lot of educational resources and data updates through our network. So if you, you Google me or, or MCG uh, and you want to sort of get hold of that information, there's plenty of that around. Anyone's welcome to, to get in touch with me if I can be of service. I'm, I'm happy to help and advice is always free. Awesome. Perfect. Love it. Absolutely loved having you on, Mike. Thank you so much for your time, mate. And, um, yeah, wish you all the best. Hope you got a, a bottle of vino next year now. <laughs> Good on you, mate. I've got one on, one one ready to go. So thanks for having me, guys. It's been a real pleasure. Cheers, thanks Mike. A lot. See ya. How'd you find that, Todd? <laughs> really good. I, I absolutely <laughs> love Mike. He's good, brilliant. Good boy, yeah. uh, I actually want to go over to New... I've never been to Newcastle, actually. Maybe that's an excuse. Yeah. It could work. Yeah. Anyway, what was the biggest takeaway for you, man? Your question regarding overcapitalization. Oh, the, the $400,000 kitchen? Uh, yeah, that was a great question. Yeah. Because well, I didn't know the answer. And yeah. it was, it's, the answer surprised me. Yeah. And, and it kind of, I mean, like Mike was saying, it doesn't make sense to invest for a, a tax depreciation reason. Like if that is all you're investing for. Yeah. But, I mean, if you've got something that you can claim and someone's massively overcapitalized, yeah. it's definitely a nice little cherry on top of that investment. He was extremely good how he pointed that out too. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people probably do go out there and look for an ash that, that they can depreciate to the max. And that's their only decision like for buying that investment property. Yeah. And that's not the way you do it. But... Mm-hmm. He pointed that out, and it's probably from a quantity surveyor's perspective. That's probably not not what most QSs would do. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I suppose like you were saying beforehand, we, we've had a chat with Mike once before. He's just his philosophy on the the whole sales, the pitch, the side of like this is why you should do business with me is just be good at your job, do yeah. the right thing. Yeah, and and I think showing that really through transparency and something that could almost actually cost a customer, but giving the right information. Yeah is exactly the thing that attracts you to someone like that. Yeah, he knows his stuff, so you can tell. Yeah. Get, like we were saying off air when we finished, he really gets excited. Yeah, I love about it. it. I'm a sucker for enthusiasm, though. He, he's got it in droves. Yeah. Um, what did you get out of it? I haven't uh, asked you yet. No, you haven't. Is that you officially asking? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, what, what, what did you get out of it? Biggest takeaway for me yep. was uh, about that 2017 ruling uh, or the change in, in legislation was that I, I was expl- oh, sorry, it was explained to me yep. that that was it. Basically, yeah. if, if you had a depreciation schedule, that that was it. Uh, you renovated a property. If yeah. I then sell it to you, nope. And he's like, no, well, you're kind of half right. It's actually this, this. And what was it? Um, I keep seeing sections, not sections, division 43, division, yep, division yep. 43. Yep. And, and just something little like that. That's that tiny little piece of information that we now are going to add up whenever it comes to buying that next investment decision. Or when yeah. I'm talking to a client about, oh, should I, shouldn't I purchase this? Uh, what are your thoughts around this? I mean, Absolutely. whilst I never give investment advice, I'm a, I'm a sales agent. I'm not a, a, an investment advisor. But if I could say, look, talk with your accountant about this, talk with your quantity surveyor about this, this is my understanding of it, but double check it all. It, it makes sense to actually have that, that information and be able to give it to the consumer. Yeah, and have that in your arsenal that will well and truly put you in good stead. Absolutely. I mean, this is all I do. I live and breathe real estate and I didn't know that. So how's the, the average consumer meant to? Yeah, 
Absolutely. No, that was good. Yeah, I agree. That was another good point. But otherwise, man, I, I reckon that was a brilliant interview. I'm I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing the animation, especially if he, he is in a pink I tutu. Think, I, think you, he, I think you should chuck, in, uh, chuck him in, uh, maybe flashing out, flashing out of a pink can, tutu. Can we maybe, we'll cut a little bit up. We'll yeah. see if we can. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, a uh, very good guy. And um, if there's a, any uh, anyone you really want to hear on the show, whether it's a, a specific type of real estate section, uh, something Jack and I were actually talking about beforehand was actually getting a, a divorce lawyer on. I know it sounds very morbid, but un- unfortunately, this is a big part of my job. Probably, a, I'm not going to say an exact percentage, but a large portion of the properties that I'll actually sell will be because people are going their separate ways in life. I'd probably say 15% of the stuff I do would be the same 15 percent. Yeah, yeah wow okay yeah. so it's it's one of those things that unfortunately no one gets married with the outlook to get divorced but if it's something that commonly happens uh, we need to know how that's actually going to work as far as asset protection is concerned for both parties mm. so if you're listening to this you're a divorce lawyer you know a divorce lawyer you know anyone around that sort of sector i'd love it if we could really get some clarity around that side of things so people can can actually partner up get happy get all loved up and everything but actually know that if the work worst case scenario does happen it's it's just kind of it's taken care of uh, but if there's anything that you guys want to see let us know as always and if you haven't already liked us on facebook follow the the channel on youtube as well click that little subscribe button and the bell notifications um, jack and i are putting in yeah a lot of hours behind the scenes getting animations done getting videos done and if you like them then yeah give it a like give it a share and whatever you guys are wanting to see we're wanting to produce as much of it as we possibly can have a good week guys that's it cheers thanks, thanks for listening bye